coming along to what's I'm sure going to be a really interesting and important um, conversation where I'm going to ask these panellists who are two Canadians and one Australian to cut through the spin on psychological health and safety and help guide us to some insights around uh, delivering practical and implementable health and safety in work Australian workplaces. No Australian, we would all agree, deserves to be harmed at work. In fact, it's their right to be safe. And as professionals, we have all um, worked very hard over the past few decades to ensure that physical health and safety is a part of uh, the automatic considerations of business. Our challenges in the future are now to ensure that the same appropriate focus is also on psychological health and safety. But Jamie, before we start, maybe we better clarify some terminology here. What sure. are we talking about? When we're people talking about stress, what do uh, they mean? Well, stress is, uh, and it's different for everyone, it's very um, subjective in many respects, but stress means that a person has the experience that whatever whatever event they're currently experiencing, they perceive it's beyond their capacity to manage or control. So there's a, either they don't have the resources to do what's required, they don't have the knowledge to do what's required, or it's just simply an overwhelming experience. And what is stressful for one person may be simply mildly challenging for another. Um, and Eldine, you know, what's the evidence saying about psychological health and safety? Um. I, I think no matter what country or what geographical region you're from, you'll see that a lot of the, the studies are saying the, the more that we are affected in a negative way, the more that increases the risk for any type of injury or illness within a work environment. So traditionally, as health and safety professionals, we've often looked at that hard hazard, right? The, the physical hazard that's in the workplace. Uh, well, the the hazard, the mental health hazard, can increase the risk of being hurt as we interact with that, as well as it can present its own hazard in, in the work environment that can cause people to become physically ill, can uh, not, no longer be able to work. Uh, so um, definitely the results all across the geographical regions are saying the more people are stressed out, the more psychological health issues are not being dealt with, the higher a risk for injury and illness. Mm. Right? And, that, mm. and then that affects what we do at home and play and at work, right? Mm. So that can have some detrimental, detrimental effects. So to all of you, are there some factors we know that are more important than others? Is it context specific? Is it, what's the evidence telling us about um, what are the uh, psychosocial hazards that are most important? Well, I think a, cou a couple that uh, in, in my work experience has been um, uh, role demands and whether they're realistic or not, both in terms of work required and the time limits in which to complete that would be a significant contributing stressor for a lot of people in the work environment. So that, that's, um, th those role demands and those time pressures seem to be almost universal. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's definitely on one side of it. You can look at the environmental context of, of how management manages. And I think then another component is the, uh, the co-worker environment because we can get poisoned work environments where people mm -hmm. are experiencing violence or bullying or, uh, and it may come from purposeful willful or in the case of like healthcare, when you're dealing with uh, medically induced situations, uh, you can be you know, harassed or stressed out by dealing with a patient that has no other alternative but to act that way. So I think that's also another contributing factor is, is, uh, is how people interrelate within the work environment mm. as well. So we, so hearing about role overloads and, uh, and uh, people, uh, <laughs> uh, relationships with each other and occupational violence, so, taking that any as, for you as a regulator that you are seeing as a really common problem, not only in Queensland but uh, across Australia? I think um, workplace bullying and harassment, so that comes under the relationships that you spoke about, as well as occupational violence, so being exposed to um, physical assault or that ongoing verbal assault that um, customer service operators, for example, would experience quite regularly. We're also experiencing um, an increase in claims around exposure to trauma, whether that be fatalities in the workplace or um, distressing events in the workplace. Uh, and I think that's the primary sort of drivers. Well, and, and I think that it's unique to the industry sector that you're in, yes. right? So um, healthcare may have some production demands and then the demands from 
or how they're interacting with their clients. Uh, service or retail may be different. Manufacturing more be a production focus. And I think that's why it's so important to have the right program components in place before you do anything. You, you have to assess where you're at and what's causing um, the, the stress or the negative psychological af affects. Is it, a, is it something that someone is also bringing from home? Mm. Because that can affect how we react or, or, or what we choose to do or not to do within a work, in, work environment. So assessment of individual workplaces uh, is key to find out what can actually contribute to that situation so that you can put the right components in place. And the new national guide that we've got really clearly articulates those nicely in terms of role clarity, job demands, time pressures, um, issues around relationships, but also um, you would know more than me, Peter, some of those reward and recognition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I guess um, that's a, a long list of potential hazards that um, our businesses need to look at. So how do they work out which ones are relevant that are context specific for them? Perhaps I might go to you, Jamie. Well, I think it, it starts with, um, and I'll be very careful not to get too e evangelical about this. I think it go starts right with <laughs> with leadership. And you know, it's not surprising that we, we've been hearing over the last two days the importance of leadership in terms of occupational health and safety. I believe it's the same for mental health as well, that leaders uh, have a huge impact on in terms of managing uh, wellness within a work environment. They have a huge influence, and I think if there was one message I could say is, is I think I like to say there's a difference between knowing something and getting it. And I think every leader probably knows that they obviously have an impact and influence their people, but I don't think people really get just to what degree that they can influence. And one of the things that I think leaders need to do when trying to assess what's posing the greatest risk, mental health risk for their people or psychological safety is just talking and, and really listening and really trying to appreciate that it, from your observation as a leader, it may be quite different from how people in the front line experience that. And I think one of the things we were talking about previously, and I'll be very brief about this, is oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, particularly more senior leaders, one of the reasons why they've been able to progress to that role is that they have either, um, through just uh, good genes or through uh, good skill development along the way, have learned to cope with high levels of stress, maybe high levels of uncertainty, and therefore, there's a tendency for them to assume that, well, the way I'm experiencing this particular challenge must be the way that my people are experiencing it. And that is not necessarily the case at all. And so being willing to actually have conversations with people about how are they feeling, what's working well, what's working less well, and really being able to hear and listen uh, to what they, what they have to say would, mm -hmm. be, would be a starting point. So is this something that you've, uh, so I'm hearing leadership is an issue, but what other ways are there is to, to actually for businesses to hone in on what are the key issues in their workplaces? Uh, I think it's just like any other safety initiative or program that you're taking within your work environment. Finding the right assessment tool is, is necessary to be able to ask the questions and at times in a confidential way, because um, otherwise people, especially if there's some already anxiety and stress and some pressures, they may not feel confident to, to say in front of a group or a focus group, yeah, I'm having some trouble or I don't like how I'm being communicated with and it's increasing my mm -hmm. stress levels, uh, is finding that right assessment tool and method that's there. And so I've seen everything from survey monkey mm -hmm. type online paper surveys. I've seen where uh, some organizations have brought in outside to do one-on-one -on -one interviews on a variety of levels. Uh, so it's finding the, the right tool and determining the right questions because mm -hmm. that's important too. How you ask them can either increase or decrease stress. Have you ever taken one of those tests mm -hmm. where you're like, oh, if I don't answer this right, yeah, I'm what's have the to right live, question? I'm going to have to live with something I really didn't want. Oh no. <laughs> right? yeah. So I, I think you know, that's, that's the right way is finding the right assessment tool, the right, uh, the right approach, the right questions. Um, based upon the objectives that you want to achieve, uh, to achieve. And, and that's to identify what are the hazards that, that are within the work environment and what are the other factors that influence that individual that affects the work environment. So there may be some questions about home or, um, and again, you have to ensure that there's a certain careful. amount of privacy yeah. within that, yeah. right? So Tegan, I know that uh, Queensland led the way with some practical tools around helping 
employers in what might seem a kind of confusing space. So I wondered if you can share with us what are some of the practical tools that are out there? Yeah, over a um, 10 year period, we've been developing what's called the People at Work tool. So that's a freely available tool that's available on our website. You can download that and you can use it within your organisation. Now it is manual, but at the same time you can implement it and put it into things like SurveyMonkey. Um, but it is a validated tool, it's reliable, and it does ask some really good questions around each of these risk factors or hazards that um, are outlined in the National Guide as well as our Mentally Healthy Workplaces Toolkit. Yeah, so I understand it's got demand and control and support and organisational yes, change. Yes, absolutely. And I also noticed, which was, uh, goes back to, I guess, our opening um, statement that I made, which was around uh, uh, physical hazards as well, is that it picks up some uh, issues around fatigue and MSD and and burnout as well. Yeah, yeah so it's got some outcome around measures. Sleeping, fatigue, those sorts of things, yeah. definitely. But it's something that you would incorporate in your whole risk management approach. So when you are trying to understand what those hazards are and the level of risk, you can use a tool like that. But then again, afterwards, having those focus groups or having one on one interviews with the staff to really un to understand the context. So the survey results might show you that workload is high. But being able to have those focus groups or interviews will tell you what is high, what is it about the context that people are feeling that their workload is high. Mm -hmm. So I guess um, what, since the, um, we're looking at you at the moment is that what is it that you, as a regulator, you expect if your inspectors are going in to um, workplaces, what is what does reasonably practical mean and uh, how, are you, how are you going to uh, see whether it's actually being achieved? Yeah, as the regulator we expect that an organisation has a system of work in place that is very much like their physical system, that psychosocial hazards are incorporated into that and that psychosocial hazards are identified, assessed and controlled um, to a way that's reasonably practicable. So what our inspectors would be doing is looking for documentation or evidence of a system and that it's actually effective and working and they may be asking for documentation then around um, data like absenteeism and injury rates and injury reports, um, hazard reports and those sorts of things. So one of, we were having some conversations before um, uh, today about um, um, what's reasonably practical, I mean that's what the regulator says, but we've heard that leadership has a really important role. What is it that um, what, what is the system? What's a work system? We as health and safety professionals get rolls off our tongue, doesn't it? Design a good design of work and work systems. What does that actually mean in practice for ordinary businesses? We've created a, a Canadian standard. Uh, one of the first countries to actually put together a voluntary standard that helps support um, a safety management system component. So it's based upon um, all the elements of what you'd have in a normal safety management system for every physical hazard that's there, but it just looks at it within the psychological ha um, hazard aspect of it. And uh, it actually is a standard that's now going to be the base for a brand new initiative with ISO. ISO is going to take the Canadian CSA standard, create a committee system like they did for 45001, and start to put together more of a global voluntary standard. Um, so that's kind of exciting. So that'll um, supplement the 45. It'll, yeah, to, on, on that topic yeah. specific, just like you'd use 30, 31,000 for risk management, and you'd use it, so it would help support going forward. But it basically outlines uh, the same components that are there. But again, leadership assessment, hazard and risk assessment based upon the hazard and risk assessment. What are the components, the training, the education that's necessary? Uh, what roles and responsibilities? Is it of the worker, of the supervisor, of middle management, of the senior executive team? And how do they play um, within that has, has been outlined within that, uh, that standard and, and to me would reflect what you would put into any safety management system no matter what geographical location you were from. So I think that's going to really be a bit of a game changer. That's for big business though um, and people with <coughs> health and safety professionals to help oh. them, is it? Well, and that's what people often think is, oh yeah, if I want to use you know, the 45,001, it has to be a big business. There's no small and medium aspect to it. Uh, one of the things that I liked about the Canadian standards is that we only have like a few big businesses, right? And, and they're really big. 
and then everybody else is small mom and pop on uh, entrepreneurial enterprises and some medium ones that are there so often when we look at our standards we we don't target just the big dogs that get to play but how it can apply it's just that the sliding scale to what you implement how technical you get how what documents and what kind of resources you may put to it every organization needs to outline roles and responsibilities they may mm -hmm. be different mm -hmm. when you have mm -hmm. five or six or seven or eight different layers versus when you are a small organization and there's two or maybe three uh, but you still need to outline who does what within that program aspect that's there so you can still use the document um, it's just a bit of a sliding rule that's there. Training, what I want to do for training for a supervisor or a owner of a company would probably be fairly similar. Um, it's just going to just be a little bit different in range and, and how much resources they get versus, versus a larger organization. Before I come back to you and ask you to kind of share that story about leadership, which mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to lose, I, I'm just interested in terms of the regulators, um, uh, in terms of that term that uh, uh, we so often hear about reasonably practical, but in terms of how you go in and have a proportional response as a responsive regulator to a mum and dad fish shop, you know, fish and chip shop uh, initiative, and what what's, what would it what does it look like in terms of what your expectations are for for a, a company with fifty versus five? Yeah, as um, we are responsive regulators, so we often do look to what is the level of exposure, so what are the consequences of the risk and um, the likelihood of that occurring. And then we work with that term reasonably practical to understand what should they be doing and in the circumstances or the type of business that they have, what is reasonable for them in those circumstances. So it's hard to say exactly what that would look like right. because every business is different, every industry is different, but our inspectors are upskilled to understand how to assess that and how to look at it. And, and, and I understand that. there's quite a lot of work going on behind the scenes with the regulators to be nationally consistent about um, how they actually apply yeah. uh, the expectations around this. The, um, a few of the gentlemen this morning spoke about HAUSA, so that's the Heads of Workplace um, Safety Authorities, and that's a group that we meet nationally. We've got two groups in the psychological health space. One is from the engagement perspective, so how do we engage organisations around this topic of mentally healthy workplaces? But from the inspector perspective, it's about building their capability and their capacity. So we've been doing a lot of work on developing audit tools and training and just upskilling our inspectorate in this space. So traditionally, if an inspector's come to your workplace, you may have seen that they might have primarily walked through the procedures with you and perhaps they focus more on bullying. But now we're giving them more skills and education and training around how to look at a holistic psychological health and ma um, safety management system and to, to give guidance and advice around that. So even your, even your physical inspectors? Yes, for us in Queensland, it's all of our inspectors. Yeah. We do not have dedicated psychosocial inspectors. We have generalists. So and I, I know you're very passionate about the role of leaders mm. um, in driving change, but you've also told me a salutary tale about um, leaders and personalities and, uh, and how that can uh, be an issue or not. So can yeah. you kind of just explain for us about uh, the role of leaders? Well, I've, I've experienced this doing coaching on, on more than a few occasions where a leader is it's not that they're lacking empathy, but they genuinely struggle to try and understand why people are not coping as well as they perceive that they should. And I think part of it comes down to just the, their own capacity, as I said earlier, to deal with stress, to work long hours, to be very, very task focused, um, to be very self uh, driven is something that they don't necessarily, are there, all their uh, uh, people share that same level. And so there's, there's a sort of a disconnect uh, and because there's a fundamental perception on the part of the leaders going, well, they just, and it's not, again, it's not a lack of empathy, but it's more of a curiosity. It's more like they just need to harden up. You know, I, I've been through this myself. And, um, you know, in one of the talks I sat in this morning, we we're talking about the importance of emotional intelligence. Um, I think I, I go back to my point about leaders have a big influence over their team. You have a big influence over how people experience their work. And I'm not talking about that you need to go around and give people hugs and tell them that they're beautiful people, but understanding that everything from how you manage your stress, how you deal with disappointments, how you respond to setbacks is role modeling to your team. 
how they should respond. And under the banner of uh, uh, um, emotional contagion, uh, you know, the mood that you're in as, as a leader will set the tone for the mood that uh, your people are in. And so oftentimes it's about helping leaders understand people may actually experience it different than you are. And we go back to our, my point about it's important to try and ha be curious to really get a sense of, well, how, how are people experiencing this? Why do you find this particular situation uh, challenging and stressful? So that sort of brings us to one of the issues is that uh, I think Eldine was challenging me <laughs> with last night, that people can be part of the hazard too. Yeah, I, I, and I, I think it's kind of to speak to your, your point uh, a bit is, is that leaders sometimes, again, don't have the tools or skills to deal with it because they've hardened up. Right? They, they've just said, I'm going to do this, I'm going forward, and that's, that's a tool they've used to survive and, and to thrive, uh, which doesn't work for everyone else. So I think the other aspect of them having difficulty in approaching things is that they don't have the skills then to interact with the individuals that are having the problems, mm -hmm. to be able to talk to them about it or to give them any tips. And then there's that fear in them that if they say something wrong, mm -hmm. Because, yeah, okay, I'm now not reacting properly. That's not giving them a good a fun and fuzzy. Now if I say something wrong, which mm, sometimes they do, now is making it worse. And so i rather say nothing at all or not participate in it because of that fear base that's there. So uh, that's where we have to support anyone who we see in a leadership position, in a role in the organization, whether it's the one owner and three workers at the fish shop or the 100 employee with the supervisor, manager, and senior leader, uh, to give them those, those skills, to be able to be empathetic, to be able to be self-regulatory so they're not saying things that are inappropriate. Um, and that they can give good advice or ask the right questions within the environment. Um, so that's so the supervisors. I, and well, I say the other element that goes to that is oftentimes the leaders themselves are just as stressed mm -hmm. as everyone else. They just have their own sources of stress. And so you've got people who are not coping trying to support people who are not coping. Yeah, which in is fact, I've seen some work by Michelle Tucky where up to 90% when she's basically done a causal analysis, 90% of the bullying behaviour can be tracked back to the pressure, work pressures that people are under. So we're sort of skirting around one of the sensitive issues here is that when employees uh, have psychological issues, uh, they can behave badly too, can't they? So what about when our own individual vulnerabilities and uh, how, how big a, you know, should it, how much does an employer have to actually feel like they take, need to take responsibility for the fact that I might be a sleep deprived grandmother? So. For us it's all about the systems of work that they have in place. So thinking about that idea of a continuum, what we say is that on any one day you, you will have people that will come in with signs of stress or signs of distress or fatigue and those sorts of issues, but it's how does your system capture those mm -hmm. people and support them? Um, and we talk about an idea of, it's based on Tony LaMontage's model, having a system in place that not only promotes good, um, good practices in regards to mental health, and that's things like Are You OK Day and Mental Health Week, for example, but prevention from a risk management perspective, understanding how to identify, assess and control those hazards and having an effective risk management approach around that and then being able to intervene early. So once someone does so show those signs of stress, fatigue, having ways to capture that and to be able to support that individual. Um, and then lastly, if they do happen to have an injury or in illness, being able to support them to recovery. So it's more so about the system and being able to support them as far as reasonably practical. Mm -hmm. So and that's for, the for other you as a regulator, you, you see there's a limit to what the employer might do. I know, Elding, yeah. you're an advocate it, of better practice, yeah, so where does um, that leave well, off? And it, it's like difficult for some workers to trust, right, to be able to say, I've just had a child, they're colicky, they've been crying every night, I haven't slept very well, uh, because they're worried that the supervisor or the manager or the company is going to say, we can only tolerate that so long. Mm -hmm. That, you know, we can't have, we can have excuses for a period of time, but, but there's an undue hardship that comes into play. Now, larger organizations can often take more of that, mm -hmm. but if you're one person in a five-man team 
and then you don't want to let anybody down and you don't want to give other pressure and then that increases your stress and pressure because you feel like you're letting your teammates down and your teammates feel like they've been holding up the ball for you for now too long and they exert pressure and it gets to be a big ball that's in there. So again, you need to have a system in place to support that. Otherwise, that kind of just keeps going But what going does that forward. system look like? Uh, <clears throat> it, it, and it could be different for every organization. That's I, I hate cookie cutter programs, right? It, it, for three, ni three payments of nine ninety nine, mm -hmm. you too can take this name out, put your name in, and this will work for you. It, there is no one size that fits all, especially with psychological health. And that's why assess assessment is so important. Um, an example of one organization that I thought did an, an amazing job where they sort of integrated or assimilated their physical hazard and the psychological hazard. Because sometimes me coming to work in the state that I am in, I'm the hazard. I could be harmful to myself and to other people by what I choose to do or not to do, especially when I interact with the physical hazards within my environment. Like, like a crane or a Yeah, or yeah. And so um, this happened to be a power generation company in, in Canada, and, and they're doing some amazing things under um, their psychological health and mindfulness and programs and such. But one of the things that they do is they do a risk assessment before they do any project and especially with the high hazard activities. And they ask about the physical, you know, it's a normal risk assessment that we all have the conversation with. And they do it with them, themselves at times, small groups with a supervisor, and it asks, what are the physical hazards? Are they controlled? You know, do I have the right tools to do the job? And then, it's, then it asks, is there any type of psychosocial hazards that are there? Yeah, we're doing this work in the hood. I don't know, that's what we call bad areas back home. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be in a bad area and I'm gonna set up, so I'm really worried because the last time we worked there, somebody was attacked. Or I've, um, you know, the dog took my bank account and my truck and they're gone and I'm really stressed out. And where they can have that conversation in a very safe environment, a very courageous environment, uh, so that they can say, you know what, maybe today you shouldn't be doing this job. Maybe, but, you know, and here's our EFAP program and here have you. Uh, but again, that can't be just, you know, here, here's your new check sheet, now go do this. Um, it has to have that system that's set up around it so that everyone's supported to have the right conversations and, and so, use the right so tools. I noticed you threw, you put in some comments there about um, wellness and well-being and I think we should actually talk about that because this is mm. one of the issues about, well, what, what does the evidence say uh, about uh, what's effective and what's not? And I know that you were sharing with me some of the, um, the literature that said around cognitive behavioural therapy, if you're going to do something... Absolutely, so th things like uh, if you're doing stress management training for your people, you want to make sure that the, um, it's evidence-based and uh, generally speaking, uh, if uh, cognitive behavioural therapy techniques are included in the stress management, it's, it's probably going to be reasonably effective. Um, uh, I know that there's some, I was reading some research on things like anti-bullying uh, campaigns can be very helpful. I think one of the things, getting back to sort of uh, st conflicts or, or threats in the workplace, that unresolved conflicts amongst peers or between mm -hmm. uh, a leader and a, a follower can be one of the highest sources of stress for people, uh, that they uh, can become overwhelming quite quickly. Um, uh, mindfulness training, those sorts of things can be very useful in helping people learn to cope a little bit better. I think one of the, the key things with training, whether we're talking about um, well-being or we're talking about uh, safety as well though is really trying to understand that just because you share some information with people does not guarantee that they're going to enact it and this is where everything from messages uh, systems that are in place to support people um, for example um, lunch breaks where people can uh, you know, do a little bit of practice their mindfulness whatever it might be or they're encouraged to go for a walk that there are systems in place to encourage this and I go back to my uh, you know, my point about leaders walking the talk with this as well, that uh, again, I think one of the, under the banner of role modeling, leaders who are proactively looking after themselves sends a strong message. One of my leaders heads to the gym at lunchtime every day and under the banner of looking after himself, and that how, sends a message. How do we balance, though, not going back to the whole blame the worker initiative that, and then focus on the individual? Because 
that's what I'm so worried about is that resiliency training or training that's targeted at the worker is going to be our new PPE, mm. right? Is if we slap that on them, then they're going to be safe and it's kind of up to them. And, and really, in the hierarchy of our controls, that training is kind of down here. We have to be looking at some of the system, systemic issues uh, that are around it and deal with and control those as well. So that's one of the things that I've been seeing and that, that really worry me mm -hmm. is that we're just going to focus on that and that's what we do with our people and then it's done. Oh, we're doing something. Um, or we phone the company up next door and say, what training package are you using? And we just use the same one and it may not be um, for for our individuals. And uh, it, yeah, it really perpetuates that idea of that it's an individual issue and that's what concerns me mm. is that the organisation doesn't have a responsibility, the individual has a responsibility. And somehow and it's because they're inherently weak. Yeah, yes. yeah, and it sort of blurs the lines for employers and what their actual role is and what their obligations are. So by kind of selling these individual programs, which is great because they are good things, but they need to be part of a bigger system of work that focuses on the individual team and organisational level mm. controls. And as safety professionals, I think it's going to be important that how we communicate that as well, too, because you're always going to have a certain amount of the workplace audience that says, you know what, this is none of your business. Mm -hmm. You know, go away. I don't want to talk to you about it. I, I'm, I'm handling it just fine. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to participate in the programs and, or see it as an evasion of their privacy. Uh, and so how we look at the bigger wellness programs of, you know, what's your blood pressure and, and all of that, I think we have to be just as sensitive with this, if not more so at times, to how people are going to react and be able to have the skill set as safety professionals and practitioners to communicate effectively what the program is all about and, and what those levels are and be able to address people's concerns on all levels, whether it's the worker, I don't want to say too much, the next thing you know I'm going to be fired, or if I say too much, it's going to be the next new rumor, whether it's a supervisor saying, I don't want to say the wrong thing, and then he does go out and kill himself, or uh, you know, whoever it may be, I think we have to have tools in our toolkit to be able to put the program together and to be able to talk about it effectively. So do you need to be a, an organizational site to, to do this stuff? It'll help. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. All right. It's Everyone did a psychology degree. No, here, but, but you no, know, we're not but, biased or anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So do you, I mean, if, if we're meant to be incorporating, uh, looking at psychosocial hazards as part of a holistic system of dealing with it, um, are we actually making this too complicated for people? I, I think we need some education in, in it. I, I don't think we should say, hey, this is what I want to do. If, if I was uh, going to go out and do a confined space entry program, I wouldn't want to do that without having some knowledge and, and base right. within it. Um, or a scaffolding program or so forth, I need to have some background. I'm not saying that you have to become a psychologist within it, but definitely understanding the process and the, and the components. Um, and I, I guess that kind of brings me to that there is some courses that are out there in different uh, uh, geographical locations and different universities that are putting on to say, if you were going to put this program in place, this is what you would need to do. I, again, in Canada, they've just started a a certificate program for managers, people who are the champions of this program within their workplace that they can take uh, online through the University of Fredericton that says, this is how you would assess, these are the components that are there, these are the things that you need to take a look at. And uh, they actually then have a center of excellency that will support with background information and extra information that you may need to have within it. And that, that's their advanced program. And then they have ones for managers and supervisors and so forth. So. Uh, just like we'd say the manager needs to have some training and education, and the worker does, I think as safety professionals, we should be attending professional development conferences like this, taking some courses, if this is going to be an area of our responsibility. And I think you as the regulator would tell us that it, we all need to be completely across the psychosocial hazards that may actually be impacting yeah, other areas that we might consider our, our uh, specialty. Yeah, definitely. We've got the core skills around identifying, assessing and managing risks. It's just about understanding that in the context of psychosocial safety and there's enough guidance out there. There's definitely training programs like you've spoken about. But I'd hate to say that you have to be an organisational psychologist to do this type of work because 
you know, we talk to our inspectors quite often that they've got that skill base. It's just ups, upskilling themselves in this particular area in terms of what the controls are and what the most suitable controls are and then what the hazards are as And, of well. course, under the due diligence requirements, uh, a person conducting a business or undertaking an employer, you might use that term, actually has an obligation to know what's going on in their business mm, and what do. are the hazards and risks. So they can't just say, oh, I'll leave it to a specialist that I'll call in. No. And, and I, I think there's a worry out there. I, I know that it's in Canada and it may be here in Australia as well is that this is a new program and initiative, right? This is going to be something that's new, but yet it's been in our legislation forever and a day that you're to take care of the physical, social, and mental well-being of your employees. And so a lot of people are seeing this as a new thing on the landscape as well. Um, and, and it's not. It's already a part of what's regulated. It's already a part of what we need to do. It's just, I think, now we're starting to build up our tools and our resources to be able to support that kind of program and initiative in our workplace. Uh, the one thing that does worry me is that we still, in certain workplaces, are not good at the physical hazards. Mm. Mm. And, and that, that doesn't have sometimes a lot of people in it. It doesn't have the emotionality around it. It's going to be so much harder for us when it is with that people factor, right? When I can't put a guard on a piece of equipment, how can I help someone who's suicidal, mm. right? It's, and, and that's... A but bit of a worry. Last night when we were chatting, uh, you you were saying it's actually about having reasonable conversations in a reasonable way. I, 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 absolutely. I think that, um, first of all, I would say, and I understand when you've got leaders, particularly frontline leaders who are already feeling completely overwhelmed and overworked, that when it comes to things like uh, asking them to be a little bit more vigilant, not just about physical safety, but about mental health safety, um, Leaders, again, who are not trying to be uncaring, but just kind of say, well, where am I going to find the time to do this? A, I don't have the skills. B, it's an area I feel completely uncomfortable with. And C, just why don't they just harden up? Um, and I think one of the things it gets back to is, I, I believe, in terms of what I've seen on a day-to-day -day basis, the really good leaders who are keeping their people safe, whether it's from physical hazards or psycho-emotional, they seem to have the capacity to demonstrate care they have the capacity to um, be willing to um, genuinely listen. Uh, um, I heard, a, I guess it's a bit, little bit of a clever statement, but I, I, on the radio a couple months back, someone asked the question, what's the opposite of talking? Any idea what it is? <laughs> Listening. It's waiting to talk. That for most of us, our definition of listening is developing a counter response. And I think that when we get really good at listening, which is really trying to both hear what people are trying to say to us and, and actually pay attention to how they're acting, um, oftentimes people are communicating to us in ways already that we just need to tune into it. And again, it's not about being a psychologist, but I think it is about being willing to be brave and have conversations going, I'm not very good at this sort of stuff, but help me understand how, how are you traveling? How are you feeling? And what is it that seems to be contributing to that? And is there anything that, that I can do? Or saying, look, I'm really lousy at this sort of stuff, but you know, it looks like maybe you need to, you know, maybe, maybe you want to chat with somebody. Here's, here's our, our EAP number. But I think it's about being brave and being willing to be a little bit uncomfortable um, to at least ask the questions. The other thing that I would say, and I always say this from a, whether we're talking about OH, stuff, OH, uh, S, um, or whether we're talking about mental health, taking care of people is your number one job. And uh, again, under the banner of leadership, it's, um, and again, the, was, these terms were used this morning about transactional and transformational. I think if, if fundamental leadership development was helping people understand more about this, our, our job, yes, we have to make sure that we're checking the boxes and producing what we need to produce, and we need to be looking after our people and developing our people. And yes, there's certain skill sets that go with that. Um, you have a situation where people are more likely to speak up. You have a situation where leaders are more likely to be a little bit more tuned in. And it starts from senior leaders, though, because if you want your frontline leaders to be engaging with their team, they need to be engaged by their managers and mm. so on and so forth. Mm. I'm, I'm aware we're coming to an end. So one of the things that I'd like to do is to um, ask you a, about some take-home messages for us all from um, about this topic and 
So perhaps starting with you, Tegan, what are some take-homes that you'd like about um, pushing through the spin to actually get to the core yeah. issues? I think it's about remembering this idea of the continuum, the mental health continuum, and developing your systems around that, looking for guidance on our website. So we have recently developed a Mentally Healthy Workplaces Toolkit. It is the first of its kind from a regulator, so that's just a little bit of a plug there. That's but okay. it, it is true um, <laughs> that it's it's really a practical tool that has everything that you need. So we got a lot of um, feedback from industry that they were struggling to understand what is evidence-based and where do they go for these type of resources. Being able to bring it all together in one place. So I would suggest if you hadn't had a chance to look at that, look at that as well as the national guide because that really provides a foundation for everything that you need in this space. So cutting through the spin, what do people... Through the spin. <clears throat> I think as safety professionals, we need to look at what are the tools in our toolbox as well and what the tools that we give individuals in the organization from frontline all the way up to, to senior leadership to be able to implement a fully um, developed system to deal with the issues that are there. So um, I think that part of it is on us to ensure that we have the information that's necessary. Uh, you may not become the, the psychologist, but the information that's necessary to build the system and give the support to the people who are responsible within the work environment, whether it's small mom and pop or large organization. Yeah. Uh, last thing I'd say is this year alone, three million people will experience mental, well, uh, mental health issues related to anxiety and depression, two million with anxiety. 1 million with depression, another 25% on top of that will go undiagnosed. As leaders, it's not a question of if you encounter one of your team members that may be experiencing uh, mental illness, it's likely a question of when this is important and, and, uh, and again, under the banner of using the, the systems that are in place or in some cases maybe demanding a system be put in place to support you, to support your people, because again, I believe that's your number one priority as a leader is looking after your team. One that came to me as you were talking and that I'd noted earlier was we're talking about resilience, but what's the difference between personal and organisational resilience? Because I'm hearing those terms used interchangeably a lot, but I believe that they're different. Perhaps I might start with you, <laughs> LD. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> um, well, I think organizations often are set up to be more resilient because it's a part of their planning, right? As, as you know, if something's going to happen in their organization that causes stress on it, whether it's a national, uh, a natural disaster, or whether it is a sales issue, a marketing issue, uh, they often have already identified some of the the hazards, the risks, and put some controls in place to be able to withstand those types of things. Um, where, so it's a business uh, yeah, so, resilience. Yeah, yeah, it's a real business resilience aspect to it. Um, where on an individual basis, we often don't have that built in, right? Uh, uh, one of our close family members is killed in an accident or uh, we suffer a loss or uh, something else traumatic happens in our life and, and it just stops us. We haven't a plan in place most often. We haven't thought about that because we don't want to think about it. And, uh, and again, some people are hardened enough that they can just kind of go and go on and others uh, don't have that um, or the tools to cope with it. So I, I think it's a real different scale that's there. And to me, that's the biggest difference is, is mm -hmm. the planning and the system in place. But. So and the one thing that I would add to that is that um, on, a, on an individual uh, definition, resiliency is it's not about being bulletproof or not getting knocked down, but it is this capacity to be able to pick yourself back up. And um, they oftentimes now using language that call not just bounce back, but bounce forward. Some people seem to have this ability that when they take a hit, there's very much, it's very much experienced almost as a, as a learning experience. And I appreciate that when they're in the midst of it, it's not necessarily a learning experience, but they, they move forward and, and learn whatever lessons they need to so they're, they're stronger the next time out. Uh, one of the things from an organizational resilience um, yeah, is, is about this ability for an organization to again take a, take a hit um, and be able to bounce back. And there is an interesting connection from an organizational to, to individual resilience. Those organizations that seem to be most resilient to changing economic conditions and such require a great deal of adaptability and the ability to make changes fairly quickly. 
to do that, they need people who are good at change and who are good at adapting. And to be good at adapting at an individual level, you need to be able to, again, to have some resilience and be able to manage stress and be able to manage you uncertainty. You also need to not be overworked. And have the, yeah, absolutely. And know that there's times when we're in the change, we're gonna be working, well, that begs another question about pressure and, and stress, but yeah, being able to respond to the times when, when you really need to put in the hours, for example, but also knowing that there's going to be an end point to that and that you're going to have some recovery time as well. All right. I think we've probably come to the end of our time. If there's no questions from the audience, I'd like to thank our panellists uh, for um, coming along and talking today and um, being part of Safe Work Australia's virtual seminars. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.